Welcome to Physics Can Be Fun with me, Stephen Thomas. Today I'd like to talk to you about how to pass your physics paper, your National Senior Certificate Physical Science paper. This is a new CAPS syllabus and they have given us an exemplar or an example question paper and this, is, this example question paper is like past exam papers. It is telling us what they consider important and what we as teachers, students and parents and learners must focus on. So I'm willing to bet good money that if you are able to do that exemplar, the, both the paper one and the paper two exemplar, and they've given a memo with those for, straight from the department, then I'll bet good money that in the June exam, which is in a few days time, and in the final exam, we're going to find questions very similar to the exemplar. And there's a certain limited skill set in that exam that you have to master. And unfortunately, I say that teachers do not spend enough time teaching past exam papers, or in this case, because it's a new syllabus, the exemplar. And I say that at the very, very least, if you have not given your students as a teacher the exemplars for both paper one and paper two, that's the physics and the chemistry paper, with a memo, you have seriously disadvantaged them. So at the very least, spend a few seconds, spend a bit of money on the paper and give them the exemplar, even if you don't work through it. But I say that you as the teacher and you as the student will be so benefited by working through the exemplar, both in June and at the end of the year. So what I've done is I have got the first question from the paper one physics and I want to illustrate the point that there are a certain limited set of skills. There's a skill set, a limited skill set required to answer this first question. And if the students have gone through the exemplar, they're going to find this so much easier. And it's one thing to go through the textbook. It's one thing to go through the whole syllabus. But those are not the same as the example paper. The example paper is like the refined nugget. The textbook and the cap syllabus is like the whole ore that you've got in mind. But they refine it for you and say this out of all of those things is what you need to focus on. And I, I'm such a keen believer in Start with the questions that are in the exemplar and then broaden out when you, as and when you have the time. So if you want to pass your exam, go through the exemplar and go through past papers. Make that a prime focus. Make sure you can walk into that exam able to answer all the questions in the exemplar perfectly. And then we expect that the questions that come in the June exam and in the final exam will follow the same pattern. There might be a few variations, but we then take the June exam, we focus on that, we go over it again, and we make sure we can do the exemplar and the June exam. And then we make sure we can do the September exam or mock matric exam as well. And with that, we say that we've got most bases covered. So let's just go through this first question. Just to illustrate the question, it's got a slope and it's got some blocks being hauled up the slope. And so here is the question and I'm illustrating it for you. So there's a six kilogram block and there's a three kilogram block and it's being pulled up a 30 degree angle slope. Now, for a student who hasn't done this before, it's going to be very difficult. But if we have gone through this, there's a limited set of skills we need to to know to answer this particular question. I'm not going to answer it in detail, but I'm going to show you what we need to know. So, we've got to be able to figure out, um, well, let's just have a look at the question. They tell us that the coefficient of friction for the 3 kilogram block is 0.1 and for the 6 kilogram block is 0 0.2. Now, usually if they kind to us, they'll just tell us there's a certain number amount of friction, say 20 newtons down the opposed to motion. But in this case, they're expecting us to find that formula, kinetic friction formula, is equal to mu times capital N, or the coefficient of friction times the force normal to the slope. 
or the component of weight that is normal to the slope. Now, if they've done that, if they've seen this formula, and many students have not, then it's simple. They just plug in the coefficient, which happens to be 0.2, and then they have to work out the force, the component of weight normal to the slope. And that, if they've done it before, is really quite simple. So, they told the coefficient of friction, so the student must at least have heard of it. Then they asked to state Newton's second law of motion in words. In other words, they can find on their data sheet force equals ma. They don't even have to remember it. It's in the data sheet. But they must be able to state it in words. And there's a skill, there's a skill set involved in translating that formula into words. So what they've got to say is a force. They've got to ask themselves what type of force. It's a net force. They get a mark for that equals mass times acceleration. A net force causes a mass to accelerate. So they've got to describe the situation. They've got to be aware the net force causes a mass to accelerate. Now they've got to describe the relationship. The greater the force, the greater the acceleration. Well, force is directly proportional to acceleration and inversely proportional to mass. So they've got to describe the relationships in this formula. And if we see that's a numerator, that's a numerator, then the relationship is directly proportional. And if they're sitting together on the same side of the equal side, mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. Now that's a skill set. I'm not going to, in these few seconds, try and teach you that. But they've got to be able to translate that into words. The next thing they ask, and they need to know that if they ask this question, most likely they're going to have to use Newton's second law. And if they didn't know what Newton's second law was, well, ask yourself what you're going to use, and then that's probably Newton's second law, which is that formula. Then they asked to draw a free body diagram for the six kilogram object. Now, presumably they asked to do that because that's going to contribute towards solving the later problem. And students have to be trained in drawing free body diagrams, and they're simple. If you've done five of them, you've done them all. So, in other words, the six kilogram mass has got a force downwards, which we call weight. And it's equal to m times acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8. So, there's a force downwards. There's a force opposing the block moving up the slope. That's friction. That's easy enough to contribute, to, to understand. There's a tension in the block. And then there's a force normal to the slope, which is stopping the block from falling into the ground. So there's your four forces. We call them the force tension, force normal, force kinetic friction, and force weight. And if they practice that, they will be able to easily do this problem. Now, they then ask to calculate the tension in the string if the system accelerates up the inclined plane at 4 meters per second. Now, it sounds a very difficult problem. And it is. It's worth uh, I think it's worth 19 marks. So 13% of their paper is solving this and the following question. So there's, it's not a giveaway of marks, but it is the actual methodology is fairly easy. What the students have to realize, and this comes through working through the exemplar, is there's going to be a force of friction. There's also going to be a, if, I'm, if I can just get rid of this for the moment, if that is our force of weight, it's going to have a component down the slope. So there's going to be as well a component of weight down the slope. And if students have been taught that that component of weight is always equal to, I'm going to have to put it over here, that component down the slope, which we could say the component parallel to the slope, is equal to weight times sine the slope angle. So the slope angle is 30. If we take the weight times sine 30, we get the component, which is down the slope. And that is your force 
of weight parallel to the slope. So if students have just been taught this, that the component of weight down or down a slope is equal to the weight times the sine of the slope, then they have no problems. And they also have to work out the force of friction using this formula, which means they've got to find the component of weight normal to the slope. So there's going to be a component normal to the slope like that, and there's going to be a component of this down the slope or parallel to the slope. So they have to be able to come to convert weight to its two components, one normal to the slope and one parallel to the slope. And this one that is normal to the slope is very similar to this, and it is equal to force normal to the slope is equal to weight times cos the slope. So this component is cos theta, that component is weight times sine theta, where theta is the slope angle. As I say, I'm not planning to explain it all to you, but I, what I'm saying is it becomes a very simple pro, uh, problem. They've got a force down the slope of friction, which they can calculate using this formula, especially if they know how to work out the normal force. They've got a component of weight down the slope, and then there's a third component, and that is this block resists being accelerated, and that force that resists acceleration is the mass times acceleration force. So there's your one, two, three forces equals our force of tension in the string. Then we have to do the same for this, because it's also accelerated, and add those forces to those forces. So, like I say, I'm not trying to go through the, the, the thing, but I'm just saying it ends up being a relatively simple uh, problem to work out the three forces down the slope for each of these blocks. And that is equal to the tension in the string. Now, if we're looking at just the tension in the string, we ignore that, and there's your problem is confined to just this block, the tension in the string here, will be equal and opposite to those three forces, which are fairly easy to calculate when we've worked through that problem before. And likewise, when the next problem is about a ball being dropped and bouncing, they should have seen many problems like that. And there's again a certain skill set involved in drawing graphs of motion. And one of the skills that they need to know is that a velocity time graph the velocity is determined by the direction the object's traveling, not its position. If it's going up and up is positive, then anything that is positive means the ball is going up. The moment it hits the x-axis or the zero, uh, x equal to zero, it means the ball has stopped moving. And anything below means it's now going down. So depending on which you've chosen as your positive uh, direction, which is usually your starting direction, anything that whenever the ball's going up, it's positive, whenever the ball's going down, it's negative. So this is a skill they learn. Whereas when they look at a displacement or position time graph, it is not the direction it's heading, it's whether it is above or below a certain point, usually ground level or its starting point. So if it's above this it's positive, and if it goes below it, that position, it's negative, irrespective of which direction it's heading. So these are skills we have to teach the students. So we need to just focus, especially before the exams, on the exemplars, gather that skill set needed to just do example problems, focus on that, make sure that before they go into the exam, able to do the exemplar question. And then they are almost certain to do well in the June and in the final exam. Work through the exemplars. Make sure you've got both the example paper and the memorandum.